Welcome to Are You Awake? with Dr. Goldal Cabo. When we can become clear and can state our intentions in our lives with this clarity, the world changes. These shows are offered to you, any of you that are reaching out so that you may find what you're looking for, answers, paths, teachers, and most importantly, to learn to listen to the call of your soul. Our topics, guests, and input from you, our audience, are meant to stimulate thought, encourage growth and healing, to teach and inspire, to open the door and to open hearts. We know this will change the world. Now, please welcome Dr. Goldal. Welcome, everyone, to Are You Awake? I'm Dr. Goldal Kaba, your host of Are You Awake on Energy Talk Radio. Once again, another incredible show. We have today our guest, Eric Allen Bell, creator, host, creative genius of bringing spirituality to everyone for free. Global One TV, G L O B A L O N E dot TV. Check it out. He has almost 19 million people in the last two years. One thing that I want to talk about that we are going to talk about, Eric, welcome. Love to have you on the show. It's great. You talk about that Global One TV looks for that thread of truth that runs through all of the spiritual traditions, minus the superstition and other trappings that usually come with what has become known as spirituality. The idea behind Global One TV is that, you know, when you study these different religious and spiritual traditions, you do see that there's a thread of truth that runs through all of them. If the truth comes out in Japan, it has a sort of Japanese flavor to it. If it comes out in India, the truth is sort of Indian. You know, but fundamentally, the essence of the truth hasn't changed. So in, in, the, in a modern age, in the age of science and reason, we can remove those aspects that are superstitious, uh, or that don't serve us, or are misogynistic, or it, we can, and uh, it, it strip it down to its basic truth, and to sort of take the best of. You know, for the first time with the internet, for the first time in history, we have all these cultures and traditions talking to each other, which is just such an amazing, revolutionary, evolutionary accomplishment. And it occurred to me, you know, in the conception and, and creation of Global One TV that we can kind of take the best of those truths and put them together and, and, and make that available for free to as many people as possible all over the world. And that's exactly what's been happening for the last two, two and a half years. Well, it's really amazing. How many million hits do you have now since 2009? <laughs> 18 we're, million or something? It, it, we're, we're coming up on 19 million, actually. We just passed 18.5 18. million viewers. You must just feel amazing. Now, that gives me goosebumps because what you're talking about has been my life's purpose. Ever since okay. I was a little girl, you know, I'm Turkish, I'm American, I grew up all over the world. And all I ever saw were the sameness of things rather than the differences of things. Yeah, yeah. And that, yet I always saw people arguing, fighting. And, you know, as a little child, I used to ask simple questions like, well, why are some people going to hell for eating, you know, meat on Friday? <laughs> Just a simple thing. Right, right. <laughs> you know, I never understood that. I can remember right. looking at my mother saying, I don't understand. Why Friday? Why Sunday? What's the difference? Why aren't these people getting along? And from the very beginning, all I could see was what was the same. And sure. I, had, you know, like, and as I studied, because I was always moving and had a high intuitive process, I would walk into these different religious ceremonies, different places, and always hear what was the same. And yet nobody else seemed to. Right. That was so shocking to me. And so here you are, well, man, mm -hmm. after my own heart, if you will, who can do the same <laughs> thing? <laughs> so I just have goosebumps right. as we're talking. It's true. Why don't people see the sameness? That's the difference between religion and, and let's say mysticism, for lack of a better word. Religion, its origin is control. Religion is designed to control and indoctrinate and brainwash, and, and yet out of these religions come these mystical traditions. So you just mentioned being Turkish. You know, Sufism is a perfect example exactly. where out of something as, as rigid as, as Islam, we have a beautiful um, Sufi tradition where, you know, they're, they're trying to find the essential truth rather than the literal truth, and, and you know, I realize Rumi's not Turkish, but he, you know, he's Sufi. It, it's a perfect example where out of an established religious tradition, uh, a mystical truth can emerge. It's yeah. there for, for somebody who, who's tuned in, it's clear. And, uh, and it seems to me a lot of people, some people are just born tuned in, and 
a lot of people start to tune in as the result of crisis. And, and I think a self-help industry has sort of grown up around that, which maybe brings us to Occupy Wall Street. I think we're starting to understand in America and in the world that we are in a crisis. We're in a deep crisis, and the crisis is that the way in which we're living is just simply unsustainable. And, you know, I, I don't have a degree in science, but what, what little I know about evolution is it usually happens as a result or in response to a crisis. So I, I see a real opportunity with whether it's Global One TV or, or Occupy Wall Street. We have an opportunity to evolve here because we absolutely must. That's true. You know, I'm a psychologist as well as a naturopath and a medicine woman and all of those things. And growth really only happens biologically, spiritually, emotionally through crisis, as you said. The biological term is entropy. When things are stagnant for too long, we'll create a crisis in order to grow. Otherwise, the organism doesn't grow. Right. It shrivels up and dies. And that whole concept of entropy comes from that. And maybe that's what's going on with Occupy Wall Street right now. I think so. It seems like what our government, what governments in general tend to do historically when they realize, uh, wow, we're losing popularity and our society's not mo- moving forward is, hey, let's create a war. And it seems to me that just in our lifetimes, people are getting hip to that thing. No, no, let's not create a war. There has to be a different way where we can unify and and what I love about about Occupy Wall Street is is the vibe, if you will. It, it, it's not so angry. I mean, the media tries to depict it that way. They try to focus on the tight shot of the the clenched fist, but really, it's it's people. I think approaching this from a hopeful point of view that you know maybe we can create a better world as these old systems collapse around us and they are clearly collapsing. Here is an opportunity to, we could focus on what's wrong, and, and I think there's a uh, time and a place for that, but simultaneously there's an opportunity to look at what world do we want to create moving forward as long as this ship's going down. Well, and what's really wonderful, you know, in the 60s and the hippie generation, it was very generational. And what you see with Occupy Wall Street are people of all ages, all socioeconomic backgrounds, all religions. And that's unique. That's different for us. There isn't the the polarization. I think there's still a little bit of a partisan polarization. Um, unfortunately, it's it's perceived as as a leftist movement. But my sense is, you know, I started tuning into this as soon as I heard about it. I'd written an article for for MichaelMoore.com back in February, and the title was "Egypt is Just the Beginning." And it was very short, and I said, we need to do this in America, and we need to go after Wall Street. And uh, somebody had just reminded me of this recently. They're like, do you remember writing this? Wow, you know. So it, it seems like it's in the collective consciousness of just about everybody in America that the way we're living is not sustainable. We may differ in terms of our ideas about what to do about it, but I think we can almost all agree Uh, this can't continue like this. It just won't work. It doesn't work, and I think you just nailed something. The media is so, now that the media is actually talking about it, how long were they out there before the media even picked it up, which was just fascinating to me. So so much for reporting the news in the moment. But anyway, that's a whole other conversation. Sure. What's interesting is the media has been very great about saying, well, what do you want? What do you want? And people really aren't sure, like you just said, how to fix it. We just know it's broken. And we want it different. Well, and that, that's an interesting thing about, you know, how we are indoctrinated in our society to think, which is, it would be as if you read a, a poem and said, so what's your point? You know, people are out there not because they have a leader or a list of demands. I, I think people are out there in response to a sentiment. How to articulate that sentiment, it depends on who you're talking to, but the sentiment runs through it. You know, there's a feeling that has brought people out onto the street. Some people would tell you, oh, my feeling is that it's about capitalism. Some people will tell you it's about their student loans. Some people will tell you it's about the environment or about wars. So that is going to vary from individual to individual. But again, you know, the overall feeling is the way we're heading is is just wrong. And, and, 
you know, we, we desperately need to, to stop and, and really question ourselves here. It's interesting because what you're talking about is how we opened the show a little while ago about this is the common thread, this is the sameness, the oneness. Everyone has their own lens their own way to talk yeah. about it, their one thing that they connect to, but yet by the same token, everyone's feeling something. Everyone's tapping into that same place. I mean, you wrote that article in February, here everybody's out on Wall Street. It does seem like whatever that place is right now that people tap into, have you noticed that, how much stronger it is? And what I love about it, there's this unity that we haven't seen. I mean, there's the world is so much about separatism again. You know, religion's becoming more and more entrenched, and any time you have any separatism, you breed hatred completely. Sure. And what we're seeing, again, is the diversity of people creating a general assembly. And I love this human microphone concept. Yeah. Isn't that, I mean, for our listeners that don't know, what do you think about that? Like somebody, I was just looking at that and participating with that. It's fabulous. Like one person says something, everybody repeats it down the line so everyone can hear. Talk about unifying a force. You know, the first time I saw that uh, on, on the live feed, I didn't know what it was, and it just seemed like a Greek chorus. It seemed like some, you know, that Woody Allen movie, Mighty Aphrodite. And I thought, why do they keep repeating everything this guy's saying? And, <laughs> and then it occurred to me they're not allowed to have a megaphone. Right. But it also, as you said, you know, they're, they're without meaning to, they're sort of affirming through collective intention. They're affirming that we've said this. Yes, we've really said this. We really mean it. And, you know, I think not just psychologically, but metaphysically, it seems to amplify the power of that intention as, as evidenced by the fact that there's an estimated, I think, 1,100 Occupy organizations just in America alone, and, and this hasn't even been going on for a month yet. Isn't that remarkable? And you're right. It does intensify the intention. It's a mantra. It's said over yeah. and over again. So now you have this unified force of everyone chiming in. So it's this group meditation, very much like the ancient Hindus, sitting around repeating yeah. mantras at the same time. It's very powerful. I mean, it's just chilling. Toledo, Ohio has their own little occupied Toledo, small little Midwest town. You'd never know it. There were yeah. over 100 people out there first day. That's amazing. It's a very conservative blue-collar town, and there they were. Still out there. But, you know, each town gets people out for different reasons. You know, Occupy San Francisco is going to be a different crowd than Occupy Detroit. But like like we said, the sentiment is the same. I think that now that the uh, unions are getting behind this, the numbers are growing very fast. Yes, they are. And And the message might change. Slightly more conservative middle America is starting to get behind this. It's going to be very interesting to see what it evolves into. That's what I'm curious about. From a collective point of view, what can it evolve to? As far as I can tell, the system in America is completely rigged. I mean, if, if we have a set of demands, who do we go to? You know, the president, no matter who it is, as far as I can tell, is just the PR wing of the cabinet. They'll say, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. You know, it's like the King, King Abdullah in Saudi Arabia saying women are going to participate in, in um, elections in 2015, and by participate, I don't mean vote. <laughs> so, exactly. You know, my concern is, if we, if we, where do we go with our list of demands to our congressmen? I mean, is it, it, the whole game is rigged by lobbyists, and of course you have to pass a law to change that, and when you do, we've learned that the Supreme Court will reverse that law and say you know, corporations or people... So I keep coming back to personal responsibility. Oh, absolutely. Now that we've woken up to the big lie, now that we realize this 1%, and it isn't literally 1%, but I can go along with that, this 1% is taken from us what's not theirs. Now that we know better, the responsibility lies on our shoulders to take that power back. Keep giving them that power is a form of willful ignorance. You know, so why why would we do that in the first place unless we wanted a scapegoat, unless we were afraid to take responsibility for our lives, and, and unless we were afraid of our own power, so we want to give it away. So I, my sense is the solution, the list of demands, is, is an inside job. You know, that's for every individual to say, what do I expect of myself? So in, until you incite an, an inward revolution... Um, any attempted outward revolution, history has shown us, 
more or less always ends up about the same way. Does that make sense? Oh, it totally makes sense. The self-responsibility, again, you know, when we talk about how you and I obviously run this parallel process, my life work in a very completely different way than yours, but here we are in the same place, in the same place in time. It is about self-responsibility, learning to check in with yourself, be responsible, find out what you can change, make those changes, and not only is there primary change, and there's secondary change, change of all the people around you once we make a different shift and we become more empowered. So yes, inward revolution does bring outward revolution, to use your words. And just real quick, I want to tell our listeners your website so they don't miss it. EricAllenBell.org, GlobalOne.tv. Make sure you go check it out and let's get those numbers over 20 million like in the next couple of weeks. Let's see what we can do. And it's, it's spelled the word one, Global One, O-N-E. Dot TV, Global O-N-E dot TV. Find Eric Allen Bell there. I tell you, I saw that and I saw that quote of Krishnamurti and I said, here's uh-huh. a man, here's a man after my own heart. I studied Krishnamurti many, many years ago and studying Patanjali and all the greats and he springs everything together. He's one of the few don't you think yeah. one of the few great spiritualists that draw from all the dimensions? He is the one that, that had the most dramatic effect on my life. You know, I'm 44 years old now. I remember when I was probably about 24, a friend had a, a book on her bookcase, and it says Krishnamurti Talk with American Students. And <laughs> I had this, is how ignorant I, this is how ignorant I was. I thought, Krishnamurti, I always wondered what the Hare Krishnas believe. I'll read this book. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's got the same word in it, Krishna, Krishna. That's awesome. Yes. So I get a few pages in to the to this revelation that anybody who knows Krishnamurti will know what I'm talking about, where he has demonstrated that the observer is the observed. Absolutely. And it, it hit me so hard. My life has just never been the same since. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. The, the, this notion of of inquiry, that that you have to recognize that the brain is just an organ in the body and that it's conditioned. And the awakening of intelligence is when we can start to identify that which is not the conditioned brain. When we're not identified with the conditioned brain as self, this is the beginning of self-realization, which is profound. And and I think when that starts to happen in mass, as, as more and more people, as, as the light goes on, so to speak, we are poised to take a quantum leap forward in our evolution, spiritually and materially, possibly in our lifetime. I don't think it's one big, gigantic, utopian moment, but I think it's revelations are occurring. Um, I feel, I, I sense intuitively, and I observe in the world, more and more people are starting to, to get it. To, to tune in. They are. They are. That's that collective consciousness we were talking about. I read Flight of an Eagle for the first time. That was my first Krishnamurti book. You remember that one? Mm-hmm. And absolutely the same thing. Coming from a more academic background, it's so interesting to me, again, to see the similarities. You know, the postmodern movement, the deconstructivist movement, it's all based on that same concept you just talked about, the observer being the observed. But you go back further, and Krishnamurti, one of his great teachers, was Patanjali. You know, that's 5,000 right, years right. B- ago B.C., and I love Patanjali. I can just read that forever. But when you look uh-huh. at bringing together the core thought of all things spiritual, I think Krishnamurti is one of the great people that does that well. Absolutely. And yet he said, you know, what have you done in your lifetime to make a difference? And he, what, what were his last words? I don't think I've made any difference at all because I haven't done it. Exactly. <laughs> very interesting choice of words. I, I mean, when he spoke very often, he, he didn't use the word I. He would say the speaker. Yes. So That's right. Thank yeah, you for that he correction. He was very clear in his language in that he was not identified with this brain-body organism called J. Krishnamurti, who has a personal history. That's right. You know, that it was the speaker <laughs> who was talking. And the eye is transcendent of all of that. Absolutely. And, you know, this Larry Dossie, I don't know if you know him, he's a physician, and back in the day he was one of the pioneers. You can still see the arrows in his back. But he, was, he wrote, uh-huh. uh, Be Careful what you ask for, be careful what you pray for. As an MD in the 70s, that was like really risk-taking. I read an editorial by him once, and he talked about personal responsibility in that he said historically what he believes is there was a time when people knew that they were God, 
that they were one with the universe. And every thought and every action that they made had a ripple effect, had a direct consequence, and that we didn't want that responsibility. And it was then and there that we started making that outside of ourselves Uh so that we can blame other, not blame ourselves, so we could have any thought, any action we wanted. I've always loved that. And maybe now that's turning around. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it seems to archetypally have parallels to the to the Adam and Eve Garden of Eden story in a way. You know that we sort of chose to yeah. remove ourselves from our our divinity, our divine nature. That's right, our own empowered self. Absolutely. Yeah. What surprised you the most, Eric, about your the response to Global One? I mean, I know what I connected to, but eighteen, nineteen million people in two years—that's remarkable. Well, I'll tell you recently what sort of blew my mind. There's so much uh, available on the market in terms of analytics that I'm just learning how to use where you can really analyze your traffic and and learn, well, so who's coming to my site? What what, what surprised me, I I assumed wrongly for a long time that, uh, you know, it was reaching a lot of young people. And um, the highest percentage of of people who come to Global One TV by far, far are baby boomers. Really? You know, we, we, do, we do have a good share of younger people, but it's, it's a lot of, I mean, especially when you're talking about the people who become members, because I approve those individually, and I, you know, they have to put in their date of birth even though we don't publish it. Mm-hmm. I got a lot of people signing up who are in their 80s or early 90s. Isn't that cool? So that, yeah, it's super cool. I mean, that they know how to use a computer. <laughs> I, I remember, you, I you know, in the 80s trying to show my grandmother how to use a cordless phone, so... Oh, yeah. yeah uh, it, it is I tell you what, I bought, I bought my mother, who is 82, a tablet, and she's been like the iPad tablet queen. She does not put it down. She's like, look what I learned today. She has all these YouTube saves and all these articles. She's amazing listening to opera when I walk in the door. It's, it, it's very, very oh, cool. So cool. But you know, that kind of makes sense because developmentally the baby boomers are in that stage of life where they're really looking at what have we done, not only in our life, but what have we done to community. And it's our turn to mentor. It's our turn to make a difference before we go. I mean, it's amazing, but the baby boomers really are developmentally in that later stage of life. Well, and, and that, that touches on something that, that's really been on my mind, you know, and, and it crosses back over again into Occupy Wall Street. I think that for a lot of baby boomers, and, and I don't know, I'm not a member of that generation, there seemed to be a perception that anybody over a certain age just didn't get it. Anyone over 30 back in the day. Yeah, that they just don't get it, and I think a lot of people thought, you know, one thing I know is I just don't want to be like my parents. What's interesting now as we go into Occupy Wall Street, and it's every generation, is that we have this generation of elders, not necessarily meaning old, but but filling that role in society, who we can turn to and say, how did you guys deal with this? I mean, when you were protesting the Vietnam War or or civil rights, or whatever was happening, what wisdom do you have to impart to us? And uh, I think that's fascinating, you know, that that, there's, that that generation exists. 75 million strong over an 18-year period. The baby boomers have consistently, since the beginning of time, since they first came in over that 18-year period, changed. You know, Age Wave, Ken Dykewald, I don't know if you're familiar with that book, back in the 80s, where he tracked, he, it's, a, it's a wonderful book, even today I think you'd find it fascinating, but he basically talked about the baby boomers and how they've changed the face of America and the face of our culture, depending on where they are developmentally in their age group. So like when they were children, more schools had to be built. When they were teenagers, we had the hippie generation. When they were in their 40s, all these gymnasiums blew up all over the place because they were going to stay fit, (laughs) and there was Jane Fonda. And there's that consistency, and I think now you're talking about that same thing. They're hitting this, um, what Eric Erickson talks about as a more spiritual time in development, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And here they are, like, blowing up Global One TV and maybe out there on Occupy Wall Street and saying, okay, who am I? Oh, they're not, they're not done at all. No I mean, way. At Occupy Wall Street, those dialogues, you know, a lot of people are saying, you know what? For example, Roseanne Barr showed up on Occupy Wall Street, and there's YouTube footage out there. And, okay. and she said, please don't make the mistake we made in the 60s. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing a whole bunch of egos out there. You, you need to come together into one big ego. 
because <laughs> good for her from a big ego. <laughs> so you know, here we have people who are you know, and also in part not just what they did right, but some regret. You know, some some ways of saying, "Hey, be careful to to not you know get divided over stupid little things," because we need to look for our similarities. It's, it's just critical. Lots of regret, you know, and I see that. I've been tracking the baby boomers. It's been one of my favorite ta- topics since the beginning of time because it really talks about what's going on in the world and and what happened after like you're at the very generation right after the baby boomers i think that your youngest baby boomer today is about 54 55 if i remember the ages correctly so you came right after but you I was born in the summer of love there August you go 7th. there you go you were, you, you were you were born of those early early baby boomers <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. there is a lot of regret because you know they were the ones that defined the eighties. Yeah, they defined the eighties. They become they went from the hippie generation to the me generation, and it made a big difference in the entire culture of our country. Sure, but I think that's just a. I think that, I think that there's been a tendency to be too hard on them because it is human nature. Absolutely, uh, to go through stages. That's right, and not all of our stages are graceful. You know there. Are, all of us have pictures of ourselves from a certain generation that we'd rather people don't. Mm-hmm, see. Well said. So, is a generation not entitled to do the same thing? Absolutely. And when you're that strong, so I think we have really what we have right now. Like you said, the baby boomers are a big part of Global One, but they're now the teachers. Right. And, and people like yourself and, and like myself, we're, we're passionate. I mean, it's been my life what we're talking about mm-hmm. today. Obviously, it's your life. You come from Hollywood yeah. and screenwriting. I come from academia and spirituality in that way. But yet, again, it's such a wonderful thing. So to take our teachers and to learn from their mistakes, learn from our own mistakes, and really create what our future can be. And, and, and then it can happen in real time, you know. I, uh, I'm in Southern California right now, but I spent some time in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, making a documentary. And I, I realized... You know, there's one tiny little sort of new agey store in town with, you know, crystals and the, you know, probably not the type of place I would go to in LA just because we have so many other options. But I walk in and they're like, it's the Global One TV guy. Oh, really? And I realized cool. in a small town like like Murfreesboro, Tennessee, nobody nobody there has anyone else they can talk to about um, these ideas of non duality or collective consciousness. I mean, not only can you not find people to talk to, but in the Bible Belt, you, you talk about that at your peril. That's I mean, true. you can really damage your reputation in, in some parts of the Bible Belt, put yourself in personal safety. You know, there's personal safety issues. People get really upset if you, if you don't toe the party line as far as the religion, uh, you know, that's real popular down there. Well, well, that's very true, and then you'll be ostracized. So that's the wonderful thing about the Internet and the Global One TV guy is that, you know, you're easily recognizable. You've put yourself out there. The documentary you were working on, was it not welcome? Yes. Yeah, I, ju- I just saw the short for that. That's wonderful. I Hopefully we'll have time to oh, talk about you. that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. But just a real quick, you were talking about Roseanne Barr, but Deepak Chopra was out there? And Deepak Chopra had a very inter- very different take on what a lot of people had to say there. He, you know, he asked everyone to put their hand on their heart for just a minute, and he, he you had mentioned the, the, the human microphone, and that we were talking earlier about the, the, the power of collective consciousness amplified, and he, he immediately recognized that opportunity and used that to his advantage. So he said, repeat after me. Put your hand on your heart, and he, and, and he, he asked everybody to repeat certain, um, I won't say affirmations, because it sounds hokey, better than affirmations, declarations, declarations about the world that they wanted to see. And then he asked for just a moment of silence where people kept their hand on their heart and just focus on the world you want to create. He didn't talk about the 1% as screwed us. He just invited people to focus on, so what is the world you do want to create? It's just, the footage is out there on YouTube, and it's just beautiful what he did. Eric, we're going to stop right here. That's an incredible, incredible thought. You're right, it was beautiful. We're going to have you come back, and we're going to do more of what we've been doing, because I think this is really exciting. You have so much to share. So we're going to wrap our show right here, and everybody remember, self-empowerment and the sameness of all things can change the world. 
and it's a beautiful thing. Please stay tuned for Dr. Goldal's healing exercise and visit innerpathicprocess.com. As we wrap up our show with Eric today, we talked a lot about the thread of all things being one, the similarities in all things spiritual. We also talked a little bit about energy. What I'd like you to do is just consider for a moment, what if? What if our voice repeating the same image over and over again is our own human microphone? What if, if we focus on one thing and put that one thought and word in our midbrain, and we focus on that one thing that we desire, peace, contentment, well-being, peace on earth, peace for ourselves, what if we are our own microphone? Chanting, mantras, those things have been around since the beginning of time. In all indigenous religions and spiritual practices, voicing the one thing over and over again brings that thing to us, draws us towards that thing. So what if? What if we got comfortable for just a moment and put in the middle of our brain, in our mind's eye, one thing? The ancient Siddhas used to practice so hum, so hum with their breathing, breathing in so, out hum. That means God I am, God I am, God I am. Which means in turn that I can manifest all things. So what if we just took a deep breath, each and every one of us, and in our mind's eye, implanted a picture of the one thing, the connectedness of all things. Let's put that into our mind's eye. So hum. The trees, the planet, all the people in our lives that we know, all the people that we don't. Every single thing that we do is connected to every single thing that they do. And put inside your mind's eye that connectedness and put a smile on it, put well-being on it, put abundance on it. See the picture of what that would mean for you in your life. Well-being, abundance, joy. And know that if you manifest that in your human microphone, and you're knowing that you are God, you are all things energy, that that will actually change everything around you by the very being of who you are, what psychologists call secondary change. It has many words, it doesn't matter. So take a deep, deep breath in through your nose, and as you release that breath out your mouth, see the picture deep inside your third eye, deep inside your midbrain, what that means for you joy, abundance, well-being. And give that picture a name. You may decide to use so hum. You may decide to use something as simple as a deep breath. And just see what that looks like for you in your life. Joy, abundance, and well-being. And be that human microphone for you. Say the word, see the picture. Say the word, see the picture. And with each breath, know that you are connected to all things. Therefore, joy, well-being, abundance, it's right there for you. Believing it, knowing it, resonating it, repeating it. It will come. It will come in forms you don't expect. It will come. What does it look like? Continue to take a deep breath. Continue to see that and see how it changes the way you're feeling. See the smile on your face. Feel the anticipation in your blood. What you need to do is be that human microphone for yourself every day. See the picture. Take a deep breath. Say the word that means joy, abundance, well-being for you. And do this every day while you're driving, when you're taking a break from work. Set the timer. Do it for three minutes in the morning, three minutes at night. And be that human microphone every day. And very soon, very subtly, very slowly, very softly, you will change. So take another deep breath. Feel the resonance, the anticipation, the joy in your body, in your cells, in your face. See the picture. Release all thought of anything else other than what you see. 
Feel your body relax. Put your hand on your heart and just let it be. Thank you for participating in today's show. Email us at info at areyouawakeshow.com with questions, ideas, or comments. <laughs>